Welcome to the Moved to Meditate podcast. I'm your host, Addie D. Hilster. If you're a yoga practitioner or teacher who knows that there's more to yoga than poses, but you're wondering where to find that, come join our quiet little party. Here you'll find resources to help you deepen your practice as well as insightful conversations with yoga, movement, and meditation teachers from a range of traditions. On this podcast, we spotlight the more contemplative aspects of movement practice. So we talk about all things gentle yoga, meditation, yin, restorative, yoga therapy, mindfulness, and more. Listen in and connect to a community of like-minded practitioners. Hello there. This is Addie. (laughs) I'm really excited to share today's episode with you. But before we jump in, I wanted to mention that you can find the details and resources for all of these episodes on my website. If you're listening to the podcast on an app, I thought, what if you don't know that? (laughs) So whenever we mention a guest's website or a video or a cool study or some interesting thing, I put all of those items in the description for each episode on my website. Like today's guest, Erica, has an awesome recorded class to offer you, and I know you don't want to miss that. So you can find all of these resources on my site at movedtomeditate.yoga slash podcast. You'll also see there a link to join the Move to Meditate email newsletter. So if you're not on it already, I am cooking up some new enhancements for my email subscribers in the new year so we can have some fun and go a little deeper. (laughs) So like monthly reflections and inquiries and activities for you to explore so you can take the themes of mindful movement and really make them your own. So be sure to get on that list and find all of the podcast resources at movedtomeditate.yoga slash podcast. Okay, enjoy this conversation. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Um, I am super excited today to be talking with our guest, Erica Webb. And I ran across Erica, I think, on Instagram probably sometime last year and became a really big fan of her work. (laughs) I'm a member of her virtual studio, and I really love taking her classes. And I was telling her before this, I'm really picky. So I really love taking her classes. Um, Although I've never taken one live because Erica is located in Australia. (laughs) So I always do the recorded versions of her classes, which are super great. Um, So Erica, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today when we're both awake (laughs) and an overlap (laughs) of time zones. Um, And it's Tuesday for you. It's still Mm -hmm. Monday for me, right? It's wild. (laughs) What is time? Blows my mind. (laughs) The world is a big place. It's so cool. (laughs) Um, So um, before I I let Erica speak, I'm just going to read you her little bio um, short paragraph so you have a sense of the scope of what we're talking about today and what she brings. So here we go. Erica Webb is a mindful movement coach who uses somatic exercise, yoga, and mat Pilates to support people to shift tension and reconnect with their body through a lens of self-kindness and curiosity. Erica's approach to movement is one that centers simplicity and gently moving beyond our subconscious habits. She believes that movement doesn't have to be complicated to count and is a big fan of using bite-sized movements to bring more movement into the everyday. So I love so many things about that, Erica, (laughs) and we're going to dig into them. Um, Can you start us off by telling us just like a little more about your background and who Mm. you are, what you want us to know about your practice and your teaching? Sure. It's it's so lovely to hear someone else read out my bio, actually. I don't know that I've I've had that for a little while. It's like, oh, I like the sound of that. Um, It's so funny to hear it because, you know, you you write these things in your head and you're like, do they make sense? And so that's awesome. Um, So, yes, as you you mentioned I am <laughs> yoga Pilates somatics teacher um my background I mean I think everybody's background story around how they became a, a yoga teacher is kind of winding isn't it and um mm-hmm. I never could have you know if you asked me when I was a teenager or even in my early 20s if you'd asked me you know do you think you'll be a yoga teacher one day I would have flat out said no you know it wasn't on my radar at all um 
I wasn't a sporty kid as a, as you know, I wasn't a sporty kid, um, but I loved to move my body. So I loved to dance. I did like competitive aerobics at school. Um, I did play sports. Competitive, competitive aerobics? aerobics. It's like, that's a, it's thing? a thing. I don't know if it's an Australian <laughs> thing. I don't know, but we, you know, we're the leotards and we do like the, <laughs> you know, choreographed, okay, I love this story. Yeah, choreographed <laughs> moves. And um, look, I was never that great at it because I wasn't particularly flexible. Like I'm not actually a particularly flexible person. So they often had to change routines around for me um, because I could only do the splits on one leg. I can't do the splits on any legs now, but um, <laughs> I could split on my left side, but not on my right. So, you know, I was like the, uh, the, 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 the odd one out in the group. Um, but, you know, I wasn't particularly <laughs> sporty or anything like that. And I always kind of didn't know where to put myself with my movement practice because I wasn't really flexible. I wasn't really um, like a great dancer or anything like that, but I love to move my body. And I actually do not remember the first time I stepped into a yoga studio. I have, I, I don't know. I don't know when it happened. Um, I think I went to like just a class at a gym with a, with a girlfriend when I was a teenager and, you know, no like moment of like, oh, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life or anything like that. <laughs> no huge no epiphanies. Epiphany. Um, but then as I kind of went into my twenties, I, you know, just started to do yoga more often and, various different studios and things but I ended up at at a yoga class that was inside a gym that was just local to me and met who I consider to be my first teacher who really kind of set me on the path without probably knowing it to want to do more of of that and one day I I just thanked her after class and I said oh I could just do yoga all day thank you so much I love it and she planted the seed and said if you love it so much why don't you teach And I was like, what? Why would I do that? Like, I'm not a, that's not what I'm (laughs) on the road to do. You know, like what I'm not, that's, I'm, it it kind of brought up all this sort of like, what, who would I be to do that sort of thing? Um, I was working Mm -hmm. in corporate at the time, I think, or maybe I hadn't even gotten there yet. I might've still been at university. I actually can't remember, but, um, you know, ended up in the corporate world, still taking yoga classes. I'd often take a yoga class before work or in my lunch break, um, And it very quickly became apparent that I was not cut out for the corporate world because I just couldn't, I I don't know, there's no way to say this sounds kind of good, but I I couldn't deal with the interpersonal (laughs) um, elements of that because there was a lot of, you know, elbowing, 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 I can't say elbowing today, elbowing other people out of the way (laughs) to get to the top. There was a lot of what I considered to be potentially unethical behavior. And there was just a lot of stuff that I found it very hard to sort of look away from. And so eventually it got to the point where I was really quite burnt out and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to go back and, and study to become a yoga teacher. That'll be a great career when I have kids. And that was kind of what I thought I'll I'll kind of put it in the back pocket and when I have kids, Mm -hmm. I'll go ahead and I'll just teach on the side. Um, But halfway through my yoga teacher training, I decided that I needed to quit my corporate job and and just get out of that environment because I was just not functioning, like I just wasn't coping very well. So left the corporate world, taught, sort of just taught not full time at any point, but taught consistently as I had my two babies and, um, yeah, it kind of didn't, there was nothing, there was there was never any one of those moments where it was like, like you said, like no epiphany moment, but I just kept collecting information, I guess. Um, and probably the mm. biggest moment of shift for me, there were two. One of them was taking a class with um, Donna Fahi, who I'm, I'm. Oh my gosh, one of yeah, my Yeah, she's amazing. So she <laughs> lives in New Zealand. And so she was coming over to um, Australia for, and she often did, she doesn't really anymore, obviously, given the state of everything. But um, she was coming over and I just took like a four day training with her. So I didn't do her teacher training course, but I did a four day training with her. And it just planted that seed of, you know, that kind of idea of like there being no one right way. And of really taking mm-hmm. that approach of like the body that's in the room, you know, or the body that you live in, or as a teacher, the body that is presented to you doesn't fit into a standard set of ideas or practices. Um, and then her training led me to find my somatics teacher, Lisa Peterson, who was coming out from Ireland to Australia. And it was a really quite funny because the only reason I ended up taking her course was because I needed CPD points, like professional development points desperately to, to kind of keep my membership to, to our um, sort of teacher body. And 
she happened to be doing the training like a five minute drive from my house, which is unheard of because I live out in, you know, the suburbs. And so I was like, this is perfect. I'll just take this. I have no idea what it is. No idea if I'm interested, but it sounds fine. We'll just go for it. And that training changed my life. Um, you know, the somatic exercise Amazing. has become, you know, so integral to what I do. Um, so that was probably my, those were sort of those two moments of epiphany. Um, and they just changed the way I looked at movement. They changed the way that I look at bodies and myself. Um, and then I would say, shall I keep going? There's one more little epiphany yeah, moment. Yeah, keep okay. going. So then I would say that all through that process I was always teaching but I always knew that there was something sort of still missing for me because I could never kind of get to the point where I felt comfortable with myself. I always felt like I was, um, I don't know what the right word is, I didn't like myself very much ultimately. I, I really went through a very deep period of kind of self-hatred and that was mm. as I was teaching, right? So I was sort of teaching and, and saying all the right things and, and believing them, mm-hmm. but also feeling like I couldn't make the changes for myself that I really craved to make because I didn't like myself at all. Um, and so that was where this self-kindness piece came in, which is really integral to the work that I do. I think it's probably if I was going to say what's the most important thing about what I do, it would be the self-kindness piece because it underpins everything else. And it changed the way I looked at movement or like it kind of, it fit the pieces together maybe. Maybe it didn't change it so much, but it fit all the pieces together for me in terms of like why do we show up for movement? Why do I show up for movement? Why do I want to share this with people? Um, And so I went through this process, I guess, when my my kids were quite young. So maybe like I had a two-year-old and a baby, I think. Um, and really realized that I'd <laughs> kind of hit the depths of despair of um, really not liking who I was. And it was a, it was a self-kindness practice that, mm. you know, for, for want of sounding kind of cliched, kind of saved me. Um, and, yeah. and, and so that's sort of where I've ended up is teaching this kind of melting pot of movement Um through this lens of self-kindness because as I looked around I was like I'm not the only one who's living in this place of kind of (laughs) not liking who I see in the mirror not because I didn't like what I physically saw that's like a different story but because I didn't like who I was I didn't like the way that I felt um in in the way that I interacted in the world so that was how that all kind of came together I suppose and in the last few years that has become kind of a, a more clear cohesive package of mm-hmm. of what I do and what I offer in the world that was long-winded <laughs> yeah that is so gorgeous I love no I love it um yeah that you are really drawing from something so personal in the way that you teach and I mean that passion is so mm-hmm. evident in the way that you talk about what you do and um self-kindness is the phrase that comes to mind when I think of Erica, (laughs) you know, you have really like, you've really put that out there on your Instagram posts and it's woven into all of your classes for sure. And I want to come back to that piece in a bit. Um, but also just that your nod to Donna Farhi, Mm -hmm. I have to comment on because I love Donna Farhi so much. I've never gotten to practice with her in person, but her book, the breathing book yes. was like one of the two first yoga books I ever had. And it was like my companion mm-hmm. <laughs> and practicing with that early on in my yoga journey. Um, I w- initially picked it up to help me with my flute playing. I was a music major uh-huh. and I was like, my flute practice became my yoga and meditation practice without me knowing it. And that mm-hmm. was like kind of this, she was integral to that. And one thing so, I'll say about um, Donna love that, it. that is, um, as you're talking there, I'm thinking, oh, I, I, there were a few things that Donna sort of said or did that kind of really planted the seed. But one of the things that was probably the most significant was her talking about the way that we can be um, honest about our changing understanding of the body or our changing understanding of the practice. Mm. She was really the one who gave me permission to be like, oh, I don't think this is the right way anymore. I don't think this is the best way. And to evolve as a teacher, to kind of be confident in 
being able to to sort of step outside of like the rules I suppose um and that Mm -hmm. was huge for me because I think up until that point and I was only a fairly freshly minted yoga teacher at the time I'd only been out of you know I only sort of had my certificate for like a few months um but through the whole through my whole kind of time doing yoga very rule-based very structured very but for no reason other than Mm -hmm. it was a rule you know um and so she (laughs) really helped me to see again, probably without even realising how significant that lesson was for me, that, you know, that curiosity piece I think really was planted by Donna, which is amazing. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Which which really leads into your appreciation of somatics mm. because that's really about, it's about a lot of things, <laughs> but, you know, it requires it requires like a really close attention to what, one is feeling and it isn't about alignment or rules or doing it right. It's really a a very experiential experimental kind of Mm. um, experience to, to practice somatics. So I would love if you would explain to us, (laughs) for those who don't know much about this term or what somatic exercise is, Mm. you know, what exactly is that? What do we mean? We're talking about somatics and you know, where does this come from? Yeah. Okay. So I haven't got a good (laughs) elevator pitch for somatics, which um, is a shame. Yeah. I've been trying and (laughs) um, it's not the easiest thing to explain in a really short sort of succinct sentence, but I will do my best. Um, So as I mentioned, I trained with Lisa Peterson who trained under the Hannah somatic kind of line of um of thought Mm -hmm. so thomas hannah who has has long since passed um was sort of built on the work of um feldenkrais so it kind of comes Mm -hmm. from the same lineage and um really what somatics is about is the fact that we all walk around with very habitual reactions I suppose to <laughs> you just set up to it's a habitual <laughs> habitual ways of sort of responding to tension and stress um or responding to you know life and we have these patterns of contraction that exist in our body that start to become very habitual so one of the, the easiest ways to think about it is if someone was to come up behind you now and give you a fright you would you know, we all know what we would do. Our shoulders would come up around our ears. They'd kind of contract forward a little bit. Our belly would pull back. We would go into that kind of more fetal position. Um, and so what somatics aims to do is to unwind that habitual tension um, in a way that kind of directly influences the sensory motor system. So in the sense that we can stretch muscles, which is often what we would do in yoga, or, you know, before we, you know, at the end of a, a workout or something, we often would, would just stretch. Um, what somatic says is that stretching isn't enough to change the habit that underlies that tension pattern. And so in order to kind of like interrupt the tension pattern, we have to almost reset the way that our nervous system controls that holding. Um, and so it requires us to pay a lot of attention. So it's, I mean, ultimately from a practiced felt point of view it can look and feel a little bit like a yoga or pilates class and i've sort of started Mm -hmm. to see them very much as kind of like one thing because i teach them together all the time but it still looks like a movement class but it's slow and it's usually very focused to one body part at a time not always that's actually i don't always teach it like that at all but it's generally with the intention of like if you've got your shoulders curled up around your ears we would do a very specific thing to try to get those muscles to release. Um, But it's not through stretching. It's through something that's called pandiculation. So maybe I'll explain that. I'm going to ask you about that. (laughs) Somatics is pandiculation. Ultimately, they, they almost could be interchangeable words. So, pandiculating you know when you've seen like if you have a cat you have cats don't you or dog you have cats or dogs I am in the process of preparing to adopt oh a okay I don't know why I already thought you had cats um you strike me cats. as an animal person I I feel I always feel like I know when I'm in the company of other animal people um you're just sensing my imminent adoption right. of a kitten right. my my youngest son is just desperate for a cat um but any any animal, you know, you could think cat is just the most obvious example, but you could think of a lion or a tiger in the zoo even. When you see them stand up from a rest, they do this 
lovely kind of arching of their back and they pull one paw out and then they bring it back in and they, you know, we can, we can picture that movement. That's a pandiculation. So it's something that we mm-hmm. do when we yawn too. So if we just let ourselves yawn, which we don't usually we stifle things and we kind of make ourselves smaller, if we yawn and you kind of like reach your arms up and then release it, that's a pandiculation. So it's an intentional contraction and then a slow intentional release of that contraction and the goal it's like a contract relax pattern and we would do it intentionally in a somatics practice and it's like with a focus on an area yeah and it's and it's almost like we've got those so you know the the tense relax often it's it's like tense and then full off you know it's like 100 on 100 off squeeze yeah whereas somatics i guess the difference between those is that somatics is like slower so we would build up the Mm. tension from sort of zero or wherever we start to more and it doesn't have Mm -hmm. to be a hundred either it just has to be a little bit more than what we are experiencing and then the release is like melting so you might think about like melting ice or melting chocolate or something where it's Mm, it's gradual gradual and it's complete so we have this moment where we just Mm. go at the end right like that little pause where it's like giving and that's the moment where it gives our body a chance to go beyond a place that it's been so if we've been kind of like a good example I always use the shoulders as an example because we all can we can all relate right like who doesn't feel (laughs) like sometimes they're wearing their shoulders as earrings um so an example there where If we've been doing that, say for the last 10 years, you know, which is not like that sounds crazy, but it's, it's accurate. It's not crazy. It's accurate, right? (laughs) We've been sitting for 10 years with our shoulders up around our ears. That's almost become like the set point for where our shoulders know where to be held. So I always like to think of it as being like a conversation between body and brain. And your brain is like, well, Mm -hmm. this is where you've told us to hold your shoulders for the last 10 years. So Mm -hmm. aren't we good at it? We're great at this, (laughs) like gold star for us because we've been holding them here for 10 years. And so this is why it's not stretching because we could stretch that muscle, but until our brain knows that that's where, like A, that it's safe to be there and B, that we can be there, um, your nervous system will just bring you back to where you started. So it's it's really a, a way of connecting with the brain body connection between the body, uh, between the brain and body. It's Mm -hmm. a way of exploring that brain body connection and almost like we would turn off the iPad and turn it back on when it wasn't working and hope that it helped. It's a little bit of a reset button um, for the muscles is how I like to think about it. I like that. And it's interesting because it can feel really subtle. Mm. It's like, we're just like subtly contracting into a tension pattern and going, Oh, huh, I didn't know it was like this. And we're kind of like discovering what's going on and what our patterns are. Mm. And then we're like slowly releasing it. And it can feel so subtle or gentle that it can almost be, you know, part of the journey to wrap your head around how effective this could be (laughs) and how much you could actually reset doing something that's like, I like to call them micro movements when I teach them sometimes because it's, um, it, there's also a tendency to like want to do more mm-hmm. or like kind of do it to the max, which isn't really the spirit of somatics. Yeah. And my teacher but, always would um, say, and I think it actually came from Donna and I think Donna said it and then, and then Lisa says it as well, or I'm not sure of the direction of the communication there, but this idea that do as much as you need to, but as little as possible. And that is not something that we're inherently designed or we maybe no not designed it's not something that we're inherently good at you know we're not taught to do we're it not conditioned we're not conditioned for that. for that we're like go hard <laughs> or go home so be, yeah. being able to take that approach can be one of the hardest things and it's like oh yeah I really am trying to to push here and and it doesn't require that but even though the practice can be really subtle the outcome often isn't um in the sense that you know we would start with like a body scan and noticing like if we were to do something with the shoulders, we'd start lying on our back and notice like, how are your shoulder blades resting on the floor? And you might spend three, four, five minutes doing some subtle somatics and then rest again. And let's just say you started on your right side, be like, oh my goodness, Mm -hmm. I have a different shoulder on the right than I did a minute ago. And it's completely different now to the left. And I think that's when we fall in love with the practice. If we're going to fall in love with the practice, it's, it's in that moment of like, wow, I can have a profound impact on my tension, pain, comfort levels very easily with very little 
um, effort, which, yeah, I mean, it's revolutionary, it's amazing, really. <laughs> um, and I think can, but that can be hard to swallow. I think sometimes because it it does lead you to be like, oh, what if I what if I didn't push so hard in other areas too, you know, like what would the outcome be yeah. like there? So I think it can be fun. It can be a fun window into contemplating that on a deeper level too, which is kind of fun too. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I think that can be like quite revolutionary to like experience something being easy mm. and extremely effective yeah. because that really, I mean, that's, that can be challenging. That can be counterintuitive. And then, yeah, it does open the question of like, where else might that be true? Yeah. And even, <laughs> even playing with like this idea of like, it's easy, but sometimes it's, sometimes it also points out that we avoid the slow and the steady because it's actually not mm-hmm. easy. It's simple, but it's often not easy. It's hard in another way. Yeah. And so we might realize that, oh, if I move quickly, I can make that movement really smooth. If I start to slow it down, I start to notice that I've got like hardly any control over this joint. And that mm-hmm. can be hard to sit with. That can be hard to work through because we want to be in control, right? So it's like, oh, yeah. if I, wow, okay. <laughs> um, and so we don't do very much either because it's quite it can be quite a, a mentally taxing activity because we're paying so much attention to what we feel, um, which is important because when we're trying to change the way that our brain ultimately controls the tension in our body, um, we have to be paying attention. Um, so it's like that awareness piece becomes very important. Yeah. Um... Oh my gosh, I had like five thoughts <laughs> about what you were saying. And now I'm like, which one? <laughs> um, oh, yeah. What I was kind of thinking about is you're talking about when we slow it down to that degree, sometimes it reveals something like, oh, I don't have as much control over this joint as I thought I did. And this is one of the reasons that I like to use somatic exercises sometimes as the like quote warm ups mm-hmm. before yoga poses in my classes because it's like a really awesome refining tool and it can like really hone us into an area of the body and bring our awareness there, but it can also kind of like help us build some better fundamental movement building blocks that can then give us a little more control or agency or, you know, whatever word we want to use for that, but just a little bit more capacity when we start to do something more complex or Mm -hmm. more loaded. So I'm curious, like, um, yeah, I'm curious what you think about that. Yeah, it's so (laughs) true. And I, so what I think about that, (laughs) I think a lot of things. Um, I think (laughs) that one of the really beneficial things about somatics from that point of view in terms of like increasing your capacity for perhaps other things that you're doing like yoga um and in fact an interesting example I had a power lifter come to one of my somatics classes a few years ago and you know if, and if anyone's not familiar with what power lifting is it's like you know putting 400 kilos on a barbell and and um and doing the I don't even know what the word's called but you know doing a clean lift moving um, heavy yeah, and doing it with a lot of <laughs> um a lot of just power behind you mm-hmm. and he had his best like lift the day after doing somatics and I thought that was really interesting um huh. but I think that what it does for us that maybe a lot of the time we don't know we need is it points out the places where we're perhaps either disconnected or kind of like <sighs> circumventing or is that a is that the right word like moving away from or moving yeah. around some we're finding a work yeah, around something a work around, that's around things that could be contributing to our movement as well so um you know maybe we can move our arm in a certain way but another option is just not available to us um and yeah. what my experience is with the practice for myself and and with the clients that I work with is that when we start to become more aware of, of those kind of like missing pieces or missing um, Mm -hmm. ways of moving, suddenly everything else feels a little bit more 
accessible, I guess, or available to us. Because if I know that when I come into like what I would consider to be a fairly complex combination of movements in like a warrior two position, for instance, if I know that I can't take my hip into external rotation without also bringing my back into extension, it's good information to have. Not everyone wants to go to that Mm -hmm. level, but that's the kind of level that I work at where it's like, do you know how your body contributes to that movement and is the way that it contributes helping you or pushing you further into the tension that you're trying to release? And I think that's the thing Mm -hmm. that's really important when it comes to how it can influence a movement practice like a, a yoga practice is that oftentimes we will practice in a way that is feeding the very tension that we are trying to release. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like reinforcing the exactly. habits that we already have. Yeah, but we don't see them. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, mm-hmm. movement as it, as it stands kind of alone is always going to do, is always going to help us in a way because it's great input into our body and into our brain. And it's, it's going to be beneficial mm-hmm. to some extent for sure. But if we go to the yoga mat to help us out of tension and we are, kind of for want of a better word stuck in our movement patterns then we Mm -hmm. can do all of those things through the very kind of like process that got us there in the first place um Mm -hmm. so I think it just opens up different possibilities for us in our practice doesn't mean that we change and oftentimes it's very subtle the little shifts that we might make but I think it brings a level of awareness to this idea too and I guess it feeds into this idea of like listening to your body because that sometimes is like, what does yeah. that even mean? Um, and I think mm-hmm. that somatics helps us to understand what that means on a very felt, in a very felt way. Because it's like, oh, there's stuff here that I didn't even know I could hear, you know, or tune into or be aware of. Um, mm-hmm. Because we're kind of more in touch with like the the gross movements um, or the the bigger kind of pieces of the puzzle. And sometimes getting a little bit more specific can help to... Um, yeah, shed light where it hasn't been before. Yeah, exactly. And I love um, how you talked about giving ourselves more movement options, Mm -hmm. you know, because there could be patterns of tension and discomfort or pain in the body that are caused by a habit pattern we're so not aware of. We just do it so much. Mm -hmm. It's just how we think it is and we're not aware. And then we bring it into every movement we do. Um, I think I've heard you talk about this as blind spots and, um, there's this term in somatics, sensory motor amnesia. So I'm wondering if that's the same or if there's more to that term that you want to like break down for us, but it's such an evocative term that we could have sensory motor amnesia. Yes. It's a forgotten something. (laughs) I don't, I don't (laughs) use that term all that often because it is, it sounds, um, it makes it sound kind of scary. I think, um, it's kind of dramatic. It's quite dramatic. <laughs> it's quite dramatic. Um, but I, so I use the term blind spots because, you know, I think we are all really yeah. familiar with driving in the car and having a blind spot over your shoulder that, that you just can't see. Um, it doesn't mean that there's nothing there, though, for us to be aware of. So sensory motor, sensory motor amnesia from a somatic point of view is really where we've got these, you know, we talked about these habitual movement patterns that we might be um I want to say, I don't want to say stuck in, but I'm going to use that word anyway, because we can always get, we can always get out of them, right? They're, they're not permanent stuckness, mm-hmm. but we might be sort of feeling we, stuck. If we're aware, we can unwind exactly. that. We can have more options. But we we might experience it as being very stuck in the, before we can shift it. Um, so if we have these kind of habitual patterns, it, it kind of comes back to this idea of like, use it or lose it. And in terms of mm-hmm. your brain body connection we have like a literal map right in our brain of of our body and so our body parts have got sort of neural representation in our brain and we want that representation to be as clear as possible we want the you know the neurons that are responsible for representing certain body parts to just be doing that right we want it to be clear and I don't want to go like too far down that rabbit hole but What we do, what we can do is we can kind of like lose that pathway a little bit in the sense that if you were, and in fact, let's talk about it from a different point of view, because I think this is makes more sense and I find it easier to talk about. But 
if you were going to go for a bushwalk, or I don't know what you call that in the US, like a hike. Um, a hike. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't think you call them bushwalks. <laughs> so you were going to go for a, a walk through the bush um, or through the forest <laughs> or something. And there's a path that everybody's taken. And it's just very clearly mm-hmm. laid out and you can walk along it and it's easy. But then you know there's other ways through that forest. The, the pathways, you might even see a faint little pathway there and you're like, wow, that's really grown over. I guess nobody's walked down there for a while. That's what our blind spots are like. They're p- kind of pathways that exist, but they're dusty. They're, they're grown over with weeds. Mm. Um, and it means that we've kind of lost, again, temporarily that ability to consciously control that movement. So you might see it in um, relationships between body parts. So I often see this where, you know, someone can't disassociate their thigh from their pelvis. And so every time they move their leg, mm-hmm. they move their low back. Um, yeah. or you might see it in a specific body part. So like you're doing hip circles and you literally cannot get your leg to go into a particular part of that circle, or you can, but you don't really Mm -hmm. feel it, or it feels kind of fuzzy, or it feels kind of staccato when you move through that spot. Mm -hmm. So there's like, it's like the Wi-Fi kind of going down and being like, what's happening? (laughs) Um, so there's that sense of there just being like a, a disconnect and that's what sensory motor amnesia is. Um, You might Mm -hmm. see it in someone who, um, you know, let's use the example of low back pain. Maybe you've got a situation where they cannot get out of a particular position in their low back, literally cannot do it. You lie Mm -hmm. them down on the floor and say, tuck your tail or lift your tail or whatever. Um, And there Mm -hmm. is They're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. (laughs) Yeah, they just don't. They cannot do it. And I know I've been there where someone's been trying to talk me through something. I'm like, I cannot make that work. I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. And so I think people can understand that feeling of like, you want me to what? I I don't know how to make that happen. I don't know how to do this and this at the same time or like keep my pelvis on the floor while I lift my leg. That doesn't make any sense to my brain. So it's these little blind spots where there's just a disconnect between what we know we want to try to do and the body's ability to do it. Um, Mm -hmm. And so somatics ultimately is a process of, refining all those pathways it's a process of you know I I, I don't want to use the word healing and I'm going to keep saying I don't want to use this word but I can't think of a better one it's a process of like healing that (laughs) sensory motor amnesia but it's ongoing because we develop sensory like as I'm sitting here talking to you I'm going to develop a level of disconnect between my hips and my brain because they're not moving right they're Mm -hmm. just sitting here and we're not doing anything so there's no input into my brain about movement because there is none um so it becomes this dialogue that we can have between our brain and our body fairly ongoing um so it's not the goal isn't to just like eliminate sensory motor amnesia from our lives because i think that that's kind of probably not not realistic realistic. (laughs) i'm never about the all or nothing um but being like oh wow I'm, i'm noticing some tension here or some discomfort or some difficulty moving and then how do we how do we address that through movement whether it's somatics or anything else That makes sense. And it's, you know, I think it's true that like our brain, our nervous system likes to be efficient. You know, it's like it's going to prioritize what we do often and it's going to know how to do that well because that's efficient and it uses resources, you know, mental and caloric Mm -hmm. and whatever else resources to like keep these other options alive. So we have to like choose that. We have to like bring intention to that. Or we will become limited by our efficiency, ironically. Yeah, and I think it's a really cool thing. Like I often talk to people and say, like, don't poo-poo on your body's, um, you yeah. know, efficiency because that's really important. If we had to think about everything we did before we left the house, could you imagine how long it would take you to go for a simple <laughs> walk around the block? Like it would be just so yeah. exhausting. So it's not about bringing these principles everywhere with you because you'd just you'd be so tired you'd be so sick of you'd be so sick of it (laughs) um but you know kind of like applauding your body's efficiency too being like thank you for finding Mm -hmm. a way because oftentimes we develop these these movement patterns or these blind spots because our body has found an efficient way to possibly even avoid something, mm-hmm. right? So it might be that we found an efficient way to avoid that knee injury that we had 20 years ago. Um, and now that, like, that was great. It helped us avoid 
potentially more injury, but now it doesn't really work for us anymore because it's it's mess, messing with our hip or whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. But always having a bit of a moment of like gratitude for the fact that our body figured out a way that was efficient and worked and got us to where we are because Mm -hmm. I think that that's important I think sometimes we can sort of swing too far the other way and be like we need to make this perfect because this is all happening through this lens of kindness right and so it's not about yeah picking apart our body and being like look at all the ways that it's wrong look at all the ways Mm -hmm. that it's right look at all the way that ways that it's found to keep you moving through the world like that is something to celebrate but also we want to have perhaps better strategies now that support us to feel well um, today. So it's sort of like having both yeah. together at the same time. Yeah, I think it would be easy to hear a term like sensory motor amnesia and kind of get down on yourself. Mm-hmm. Like, how could I have forgotten how to use my body? And yeah. <laughs> that's my fault or whatever. And that's not really the point. The point is that we can recover these options and and patterns and we can have some sense of influence over Mm. how we move and how we feel and knowing that that's a choice too like you don't have to if you don't want to like do you know what I mean (laughs) there's no shoulds in this either it's just like does it help you to feel good and if it does great you have this as a tool and if if it isn't for you then that's okay too I think um sometimes when we go down that kind of path that feels sort of corrective um I'm always really Mm -hmm. mindful of my language because I don't want it to come from a place of like feeling like you need to fix yourself because that Mm -hmm. belief that we're broken, you know, is it doesn't help us really um, to go to where we want to be. So I always try to like balance it out because it's, yeah, it ha- it ha- I, th- I think it really had, like if there's one should here, it really has to come from that place of self-kindness because I just don't think it works the same way if it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what we know about or what we're learning about pain science mm. would validate that, 100%. <laughs> that our beliefs about things and our optimism can actually make a huge difference yeah. in how we feel. And, you know, speaking of which, like when, when I have a, like a private student with pain, who's coming in to either do a practice kind of around, like working around Mm. that area, or who's trying to kind of like recover some movement after they've done physical therapy or something. I often will start with somatics because like, first of all, it's really gentle and especially with people who have kind of like a little bit of fear of the movement after having experienced pain in that part of the body, it's like a really good way to reintroduce something small and manageable where they can regain some kind of like confidence that it's possible to move that part of the body without sparking a huge firework show of pain, (laughs) you know? So I use it a lot with, I, I work with a lot of people who have pain. Um, and yeah, it's my favorite modality for that reason, I think, because the fear level is very you can you can really drop the fear level um a lot. And that's not, you know, and sometimes you can't. Sometimes you have to move around that part still because it, you know, I've I've certainly worked with people where uh the thought of moving it at all is enough to turn, you know, mm-hmm. to send them into a spasm um of sorts and to to be quite fearful. So there's ways around that always, but I think um it is a it is such a wonderful modality for that fear factor because you know I'm you're not asking anyone to pick up a weight um, and I mean I love weight training so it's, that's not to say that weight training is bad mm-hmm. but it's a really good yeah, window here. into into movement again for people who perhaps feel a little bit fearful or um, yeah it's I mean it's very powerful from a pain point of view and part of the reason for that is because we're changing the input that they're receiving very subtly very mm-hmm specifically um and so yeah I think it works really really well as part of a pain management pain education um kind of program because it involves that mind body kind of like re-education which I think is yeah it's it's very cool yeah and pain like the experience of pain actually changes how the brain yes. senses the body and like it disrupts the connection. It like probably inevitably creates that mm-hmm. blind spot experience. And um, 
you know, and even can even change our body image and like the way our brain maps the body and all of these different things. So I think it can be a great somatics can be a great tool for like remapping Mm -hmm. and relearning and re-inhabiting an area that's been impacted. Yes. And re re embodying it too, because so often when we have these pain situations, we are disconnected but not just in a brain body kind of way like we've really made it other to us because it it, Mm -hmm. you know it it feels safer almost to kind of like make it not a part of you so um Mm -hmm. there can be that real sense of like um we don't even talk about it as like our body part, you know, like we might talk about it as mm-hmm. oh, the dodgy leg or the dodgy hip and it doesn't, <laughs> it's not even ours anymore. So I think somatics can help us to re-embody those parts of ourselves that we've perhaps kind mm-hmm. of not disowned, but started to like feel negatively towards or, or not even started. Like we yeah. might feel really negatively towards them. So I think it starts, <laughs> helps us to start to like reconnect in a really kind way as well. Yeah. And we started to touch on this or you kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, but like stretching in this realm of somatics and from this lens and, you know, what, how, how stretching is viewed Mm -hmm. in the world of somatics or how, um, how that fits in if you are weaving together like yoga and somatics, because some I've come across like certain somatics teachers that kind of seem Mm anti-stretching. Or at the least, it's like, this is unproductive, or sometimes it sounds like they're saying it's counterproductive. Mm. I'm kind of like, hmm, where do you sit with all of this? And like, how does that fit together and, yeah. um, in your mind? Yeah, it's a great <laughs> question. I, And it's an interesting one, because I think I've sat at different points along the continuum over, over the last decade. Um, my current thought around that is that like nothing's bad, you know, like stretching isn't bad. Mm -hmm. Um, It definitely has gotten a bad rap in recent years amongst various people. Um, But no movement ultimately is bad. No way that we can use our body is bad. Um, It doesn't mean that some won't have certain outcomes that maybe don't feel great for us in the moment, but inherently none of none of those things are bad right and it's just kind of like what is our body prepared for but I guess from a point of view of somatic stretching I think because I weave somatics into Pilates and yoga and and the two teachers that I've learned from um which is Lisa Peterson and James Knight I've also done some training with James Knight and they Mm -hmm. both teach yoga too right so they're yoga and somatics teachers um When we're actually doing, I guess, a somatic movement by itself, we're we're ultimately sort of trying to avoid the stretch reflex. So the stretch reflex kind of is where the muscle automatically contracts when it's under stretch. Um, Mm -hmm. And so if we've gone through this process, I suppose, of, of trying to encourage this muscle to Ultimately, it's we're encouraging it to relax. We're not really encouraging it to stretch. Um, we're, we're sort of trying to get it to a set point that just feels more comfortable where it's not contracted. Um, mm-hmm. So if we were to, to do that somatics and then go into an aggressive stretch, I think the argument there that I've heard is that, well, you're going to maybe create the stretch reflex or like trigger the stretch reflex, which is just going to bring you back to where you started. That's my understanding. It's going to like undo what you had accomplished exactly. by releasing that muscle. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know if I, I don't know. I don't know. Ultimately is the answer to that question. Yeah. We always do what's called like a lock-in or a, or a um, is that the right term? I'm not sure if that's the term that, that Thomas Hanna used, but there's this sort of moment of like staying in the released Point. So um, an example might be where we sort of roll our shoulder in towards our chest. And after we've done that a couple of times in that pendiculation method, then we would tuck our shoulder underneath us just for a moment. And I think the guideline mm. that I've heard in the past in somatic world is like no more than three seconds, because after three seconds, you're going to kind of initiate this stretch reflex. Um, hmm. I don't, I'm not that pedantic <laughs> um, at all. <laughs> I appreciate yeah, that. I'm not, I just, I'm not really big on rules um, yeah. at all. I just think, what does it feel like? You know, that's what I always come back to is like, what mm-hmm. does it feel like? And is it leading you towards how you want to feel? And so, you know, I still stretch. Um, I, I don't teach a huge amount of stretching. 
Um, and the stretching mm-hmm. that I do teach usually tends to be isometric um, in nature. Um, but that's not because I don't like stretching. Um, what I mm-hmm. think, though, is that from a from the perspective of, I guess, um, pain science, because I, I often come back to that lens of, you know, how is my brain kind of receiving this information? I think people have a pretty hard time sometimes knowing when to stop with stretching. Um, yeah. And so if we are taking our True. body into stretch and we're like, just like, Oh my God, that feels so good. And I, it must be good because I can feel it burning or I can feel it pulling or however you would describe it. If ultimately our brain is going to make a decision about what to do with that next. Right. And if our brain makes the assessment that you're trying to take your, your body part or your muscle into a position that you haven't got the capacity to then come out of or control or, mm-hmm. you know, you're leaning forward and I, you know, we don't trust that you've got the support there to actually get back up. Like we're, we're fearful that you're going to fall on your face. Mm-hmm. Um, then yes, stretching could lead you to, to a, like a big contraction um, either in the moment, mm-hmm. which will feel a lot, like pain um or (laughs) later because your body's pulling you back Mm. to where you were before Mm -hmm. um so I'm very I guess I'm kind of anti just aggression with our bodies I'm I'm anti push I'm anti (laughs) good policy yeah it's a good policy I think because it never you know and I, I often use this example of like if you have a pet or you have a child and you're trying to get them to do something we all mm-hmm. know that when we lose our temper, which like I'm not saying I never do, I, I, I lose my temper so I can picture this in real time. I, <laughs> When I lose my temper at my kids or I yell or I whatever, that does not lead them to feel safer. <laughs> you know, it doesn't lead them to <laughs> feel like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do what you've asked out of, you know, out of love. Um, you know, the dog will panic and, and you can see in their body You know, when you yell at them, you can see in their body. And that's how our bodies respond too. We are no different to the dog or the child who doesn't like to be scolded. And so if we are pushing ourselves into these stretches, if we're doing them in an aggressive way, thinking that we can physically just have an effect on the tissues, we're forgetting that our brain is ultimately in in control of what's going to happen next. And if we – so this is where if you're feeling tense all the time but you're like, but I stretch, I stretch (laughs) – I stretch. Mm -hmm. Why isn't this working? Um, It's probably because your brain hasn't picked up that it's actually safe for you to go into that range. And so you're just going to keep getting back Mm -hmm. into tension. So I think that stretching is great, but it's not everything. And it it can't be our only strategy Um, unless it works for us, you know, like it can't be unless it is. And (laughs) and I think that's the thing because there's always exceptions to the rule. You know, there's always going to be that one person who's listening who's like, I feel great when I stretch. Um, this is what they need this is exactly it. exactly so there's no absolutes but you know for the -the run-of-the-mill like if I was giving run-of-the-mill advice um, stretching is alongside other stuff and and done Mm -hmm. in a particular way you know I often talk about um, if you are going to stretch double check that you can still breathe you know like actually can Mm -hmm, you breathe mm -hmm. not just like (gasps) but like can you breathe through (laughs) your nose do you feel calm you know are you clenching your teeth are you making fists with your hands those are all signs that your brain is saying "Mm -mm, this is too much too much Um, so I think stretching is fine but just be aware of I guess it's limitations for you if if it feels like a limitation um but yeah no rigid rules no it's so tiring I'm so I I find rules just it's just so tiring (laughs) and rules are a really quick way to feel bad about yourself you know like yeah it's just well and the next thing you know some research is going to be done that refines the whole thing and like you might be part right but you might be (laughs) half wrong and you know it's like exactly we need to stay open and flexible to you know no pun intended to Mm -hmm. like learning more Mm -hmm. like my thing is I think that there's benefits to stretching that are probably not what most people yeah, think they are. And that's true. We need to approach it in a really gentle and mindful way when we're doing mm. it and also do it, like you said, alongside other, you know, types of movement activity, like strengthening yeah. and like these kind of somatic movements and pendiculations, because yeah. it's like the body needs this whole 
balanced nutrition. Exactly. <laughs> right. And I think I think stretching is a really interesting one. You just met, reminded me of um, something somebody said to me once after a class. They said it was all right, but I really wanted to stretch more. And this was someone who'd mm-hmm. never been to one of my classes before. And I'm reminded of your podcast interview, of your podcast episode about, you know, your one star review. <laughs> It was the same oh, yeah. sort of thing where it was like, but you came to a restorative <laughs> yoga with somatics. Like, like I literally said at the start of the class, we weren't going to be stretching. Like that was truly not what you were here to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've always remembered that because it always makes me think about the fact that sometimes why stretching feels so satisfying is because it is very concrete in the sense that we can feel it. And it mm. feels, it feeds that need and desire that we have to be doing and to be achieving something and I think that sometimes the subtlety of somatics can feel a little bit like am I wasting my time what am I doing yeah (laughs) and we don't want to waste our time you know like that's the thing is as humans we're so driven to not waste our time um, and to be productive all the time and I think I think stretching feels far more productive sometimes Mm -hmm. in in the immediacy of it um yeah yeah, that's that's the other thing that's interesting about stretching. I think, yeah, it's it's immediate. Totally, it's I think direct. there's a, a like a lot in there that could be cultural conditioning oh, yeah. that we don't recognize. Totally, <laughs> like about productivity and being in control and yeah, and I st- instant results you know, and, I and all this with stuff that still all the time. You know. I, Sure. Absolutely. And, you know, I notice it as a teacher too, kind of feeling like, have I included enough in this class? And is there enough? And am I enough? And is this Mm -hmm. enough? And will they Mm -hmm. feel, you know, so it is insidious. It's everywhere. But I think that's why (laughs) our movement practice can be so transformative because it invites us to like, look at those things and be like, that's really interesting. You know, am I moving in this way today because I'm feeling like I need to control something or like I need to um, yeah. be more productive because I'm feeling guilty about the fact that I haven't done X, Y, Z. Um, so I love that because it can spill into our lives in, in the best possible way. And this brings it back around to the underlying, you know, theme of self-kindness mm. And how often we we do have this undercurrent of dissatisfaction that may or may not be recognized, mm-hmm. you know, the way that we talk to ourselves or the way we push ourselves um, or expectations we have of ourselves. And we bring that into whatever movement practice. Yeah. It might be the motivation for even starting a movement practice that I'm dissatisfied with myself. Yeah. This will fix it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so. Can you talk a little bit more about how you flip that with your emphasis on self-kindness and, you know, how you bring that to light? Mm. I know that's a huge <laughs> It topic. is a big topic. <laughs> huge question. I, I mean, to me, like self-kindness is just everything. And I think um, it's interesting when you say like the reason for coming to our movement practice sometimes can be fueled by something that is not kind. And I think that is more often than not the case. Um, because Mm -hmm. we want to be better. And I really struggled with, um, like, I can't remember who I was talking to the other day, but we talked about the fact that I like experienced self, um, what's the word, um, self-development burnout, right? Like just trying to be better all the time. Oh yeah. And it was this moment of being like, wow, being better for being better's sake isn't the way. <laughs> it's not <laughs> useful. It really comes from a place of lack and it, it comes from a place of feeling like not enough. Um, and so I think that what self-kindness allows us to do is really ask the question of like, what do I need? And and not from the point of view of like, what should I do? What is expected of me? What am I feeling guilty about? But like actually what feels kind in this moment? And and it's not absolute. You know, we're talking about how much I hate rules and <laughs> there's no rule for that. Just self being self kind doesn't mean doesn't maybe doesn't mean showing up to your mat today. Maybe it actually means that you don't. But maybe tomorrow it means that you don't feel like it. But the kindest thing to do is to show up on your mat. So that mm-hmm. can be very hard to navigate because it's like, well, just tell me what to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like you know, yeah. just tell me what to there's do, no when, for how long, <laughs> how many repetitions. Yeah. And so it becomes kind of hard, I think, to navigate through that lens. But it's so worth it because I think then when we come to our practice on the mat or whatever movement practice we're doing we have to be honest about how we feel 
We have to be honest about what's actually going to feed us, support us, nurture us, challenge us. Because Mm -hmm. sometimes I think that this idea of self-kindness can come across as being a bit soft in the sense that, you know, being kind to yourself Mm -hmm. is always going to be the easy option. But in my experience, the self-kind thing is often the hard thing because it's not something that we necessarily feel like doing. We don't have the motivation. And so to do something that we don't feel like doing with kindness and not Mm -hmm. guilt can be really tricky. But it's possible yeah. because I think that, you know, I can sit here and be like, I genuinely don't feel like going and rolling out my mat and doing anything today. And and sometimes I don't, you know, like I, I genuinely don't. I don't have a lot of structure around my self-practice. I, I sort of do what I want when I want. Um, I'm like a rebellious child, um, <laughs> which, which I'm aware free of. Spirit. And Let's call it that. Working through with my therapist. <laughs> but it's like, you know, we have to be honest. And, and I think if I didn't feel like stepping onto my mat, but I'm like, but also I had a really difficult conversation this morning and I'm feeling quite anxious Mm -hmm. and I can feel my shoulders are really tense and I've been on this podcast. And so my hips are a bit tense. Actually it feels kind to just like show up anyway for myself. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing it from guilt. I'm doing it because it feels kind versus oh my God, I've been sitting here for an hour and my hips are really sore. I really should do it, but I can't because I've got this other call that I need to make and I've got this thing that I have to do, but oh my God, I can't, I can't deal with the guilt of not showing up. So, you know, and we just tie ourselves in knots. Um, So I think the self-kindness piece also then gives us permission to be like, okay, the kind thing probably would be to lie down right now, but I'm still not going to do it. I'm choosing to walk away. And doing it Mm -hmm. without guilt and doing it without shame and doing it without anything other than just the responsibility to just make a choice. Um, So I think that, and I don't know that I'm answering your question that well because I can feel myself rambling. Yeah, no, this is great. (laughs) I think it's just, it's a lens through which we can then just make decisions, you know, and uh, I wish it was one of those things where we just went, right, I choose kindness and done. Like I I forever will just choose kindness and this is going to be easy. (laughs) But it's constant. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, for me, it's a constant choice. Sometimes it's like, um, you know, I've had to have some difficult conversations lately and, and before having them, it's like, what feels kind right now? And, and sometimes Mm -hmm. it's like, it feels kind just to do this, just to get it done, to just do it because I'm going to feel better later and it needs to happen. Or, um, you know, like, like, there's just like the other side of this desk right now is like an actual shambles it is a mess and <laughs> you know sometimes for me like I, and I've talked to a girlfriend about this recently like sometimes for me cleaning the bathroom cleaning the toilet is an act of self-kindness because I want the outcome of that thing and so it's not about mm-hmm. the shoulds it's not about you know well it just has to happen because I said I would it's like really paying attention to what will nurture me what do I need And there's no absolute, it doesn't have to be a bath, it doesn't have to be a candle, but it might be. It could also be, you know, something hard. So, it, yeah, it just becomes this lens lens through which we can make decisions and um, assessments, I guess, about what we, yeah, what we need. Um, It becomes such a rich practice of Mm. self-awareness because, like, really what you're, you're saying is, like, really observe yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, where are you coming from in this moment? And if you have two options in front of you and where you have a certain impulse, like, are you choosing a, because you just need to indulge that Mm -hmm. impulse today? Are you choosing a, because you feel like I'm the kind of person that has to get X done or else, or, (laughs) you know, are you choosing a, because it would genuinely feel good Mm -hmm. later or, calm you down and you know that would make dinner more pleasant with your family and it could even be like long term than that you know like I want to be able to um get down on the floor with my great grandkids when I'm 90 so I'm going to make a kind choice today that's going to sort of lead me (laughs) towards that and and so I think it yeah becomes like a really interesting way of playing with um Mm -hmm. the myth of motivation too because you know motivation really like it isn't really a, a useful idea in a lot of ways um but that can become our motivation right like kindness can become our motivation it doesn't mean we feel like it all the time um but I think it it gives us pause 
um, to think things through. And, you know, I choose away from kindness. Like I absolutely do. Of course. And and so it's not about always getting it right. Like some days I'm like, yes, I'm going to have another glass of wine or I'm going to watch Netflix until after my bedtime because I like, (laughs) I want the immediate satisfaction of that. And I know that maybe it's choosing away from what is ultimately kind, but I still get to choose and I get to choose without guilt. Um, Mm -hmm. But then there'll be other days where it's like, oh, I really want to watch another episode of my favorite show, but I know I need that eight hours in bed. So off I go. Um, but again, without Mm -hmm. the guilt. And it's like part of this practice is not just that decision part, but observing ourselves throughout the whole thing, like while we're doing it. And then after like what happened after, what was the outcome of that? And, you know, not to make it a judgment, but like just a process of mindfulness, really. Exactly. Exactly. And, and okayness with ourselves, you know, I just think having, having lived with so much self-hatred, uh, it's just such a, it just is such a prison, you know, it doesn't, it isn't a nice place to hang out. Uh, and I know for me that like self-love was way too big a stretch. It was too far away. It was mm. such a novel concept. Um, but like, what could be that just like the next kind choice that was palatable, that was a little mm-hmm. easier. So that's kind mm-hmm. of, I think why I landed on self-kindness in the first place, because it can be that moment by moment. It's not an absolute, you know, it's not like a, just okay now we now it's just done it's this moment by moment choice and idea um that we can have a little bit more I don't know like we can play with it a little bit more maybe in a non-absolute kind of way which which uh, which really suits my free spirit (laughs) (laughs) well and I think like what you're saying about like self-love sounded too lofty Mm -hmm. I mean I think this is why our practice on the mat is such a good place to play with this because we can practice it in tiny, tiny choices. Like my impulse is to yank my Mm -hmm. leg into this a little bit further, but could I, would it be a little more kind to just go more slowly and see how it feels and have a conversation with my hip? And (laughs) it can be, you know, that's like a movement towards kindness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a safe little playground, you know, it's this, confined space where you can be like I'm going to do this for half an hour and then I'm just going to forget about it I'm going to move into my day um yeah and there's a thousand opportunities to practice kindness in that exactly exactly (laughs) absolutely yeah well I have loved this conversation Erica and I just looked at the clock and I'm like oh my gosh we've been talking for more than an hour I didn't even know I'm (laughs) like where's the clock we could just talk all day I'm pretty sure it's just gone by so quickly and I really enjoy your perspective on things and all that you've shared um would you like to tell people a little bit about where they can find you or follow you or practice with you yeah for sure so the easiest place to find me and kind of connect with me is on Instagram. Um, I'm at Erica Web Yoga over there. Um, I'm at Erica Web Yoga on Facebook too, but don't sort of spend as much time there. Um, and you can find my <laughs> website, which is ericawebyoga.com.au because it's in Australia. Um, and really happy to, to hear from anyone. I do, um, you know, I do work with people all over the world, as as Addie said, you know, part of the membership Um which is not open at the moment, but, you know, anybody who wants to get in touch is very welcome to. And I love chatting with people, particularly over on Instagram, but you can certainly email me as well through my website. Um, and if you've got questions, I'm, I'm more than happy to uh, chat. So, yeah, reach out. And Erica has a podcast oh, yeah. as well that's a really excellent resource. What's your podcast called? The podcast is called the Movement and Mindfulness Podcast. So that's available in all the places. Um, you just have to make sure you put the the at the beginning because you won't find it otherwise. So the Movement and Mindfulness Podcast. Um, and there's a link to that on my <laughs> website as well. I forgot about that. Thanks, Addy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I figure if they're listening to this podcast, yeah, they right. might be looking for other good podcasts to hear. That's right. I have had my teacher, um, Lisa Peterson over there too. So if, if somatics is that was a good yeah, one. something that yeah. kind of like sparks interest, um, that's a really good one to tune into because she is, um, she is pretty amazing when it comes to somatics. Yeah. And I think you had another episode called what even is somatics yes, or I something think so. like that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there's if some people want to, <laughs> hear a little bit more we talked about a lot of that but it might be a good recap and um yeah and there's actually I think on my website too there's a free somatics class um so if you want to try that I'm just trying to think how you get there so you go to my website which is ericawebyoga.com.au 
free resources, and then it's called the Full Body Unwinding class. So that just opens up a window. You don't have to sign up for anything. You can just um, just watch it. It's about Give 40 it minutes. and Yeah, it's a full body <laughs> somatics class. So if you're curious, you're like, what even is this? Um, that's a really good way to experience it in a little <laughs> bite size chunk. I'll make sure to link that awesome. so Perfect. people can try it. Yeah, because we've been – trying to describe this experience, but it's, it's best, best done felt. on your mat yes. <laughs> and you just got to try it to, to kind of get exactly. it. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you so much for having me, Addy. My pleasure. Thank you. So that's today's episode. If you enjoyed this conversation, please share it with a friend and, or leave us a review on Apple podcasts and help others find us that way. To learn more about my work, the Moved to Meditate class library, live online classes, teacher trainings, and private lessons, go to movedtomeditate.yoga. Thanks so much for listening.